Well, good evening. It is great to be here, and as always, so great to see everyone out. We want to uh, express our appreciation for you coming out on this wet day and this dark, dreary night, but we are going to open up to the God's Word, the light of the world, and uh, try to shed some light on the darkness that we have experienced today. And uh, we want to have a word of prayer before we get into our class. And I'm going to ask Dalton, if you would, to come and lead us in that prayer this time. Bow with me. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for another day that you bless us with. We are thankful for the rain, recognizing the blessings that it does bring us, even though sometimes it's not as convenient to, to run through or walk through as we might like, Father. We're so blessed to have it. We thank you for it. We're thankful for everyone who is able to be here tonight, and their safety in getting here. We pray your blessings on each of us that as we open your word tonight, that we'll be able to have the open hearts that you would have us to, Father, that we'll be able to focus, clear minds from the business of our day and and be able to absorb your word and apply it in our lives and not only be better for it, but help others to be better for it as well and, and being that example that you would have us to be. Father, we're mindful of those who are unable to be here tonight. So many of our number that, that are on our list and those that have been shut in for quite some time and, and others who may be dealing with ailments that we're not even aware of. And we just pray that you'll bless each of them and meet their needs as you see fit, that those tending to them might have the wisdom to prescribe them to help them in the ways that they need so that they can get back to their much wanted health and be back with us very soon. Father, we're mindful of those as well who've lost loved ones. We pray that you'll comfort them and, and that those around them, they'll be able to lean upon and upon us, your church, that we can be there for them and help them and bring them that comfort that they need in, in such difficult times. Father, we're always mindful of our nation as well and, and its leaders. We pray that you'll bless those leaders with wisdom as well, that circumstances will help them to remind them that, that you are there, Father, and that they need to look to you, that we all need to look to you as we make decisions and that these leaders will, will help drive us in a, in a better direction uh, than we have been recently. Father, we're so, so very thankful to know that you hear us, that you hear the things that we're asking of you, Father, that we can express our gratitude to you, but we also recognize that that can be hindered by sin in, in our lives. Father, we pray for forgiveness. We pray that We'll be better in the future than we have been in the past. And we pray that we'll continue to look to you for strength and guidance and to, to your son and to follow in his footsteps. Again, to be that example so that we can lead others to thee. And as Paul said, Father, we, we pray for those doors of opportunity to be open, doors of utterance that we can teach others and that we'll have the confidence uh, and knowledge of these things we've been discussing all year to, to share those things with them and lead them to thee before it's too late. Father, most of all, we thank you so much for sending us your son. And we pray, Father, that we'll strive again more and more every day to be like him. We pray through his name. Amen. Amen. Appreciate that prayer so very much. You know, I don't tell you as often as I should how much you mean to me and what an encouragement you, know, you are to me, but you know, it does not matter what kind of day I have had up until this point. And the same goes with Sunday. Uh, it doesn't matter what kind of day I've had or the past couple of days. When I stand before you and I look out at you and I see you with your Bibles open, and I see you with your hearts open and wanting to read and study God's Word. It's almost, and I can't explain it, it's almost as if every trouble I have just melts away. And so I know many times you say, you know, that was a good lesson, that was an encouragement, but you do not have an idea. I mean, not even a glimpse of how encouraging that you are to me. 
And so I, I just want you all to know that from the very bottom of my heart. We are looking at the visions that we see in the book of Zechariah. And of course, that is part of the uniqueness of the book. I'm going to hurry through all of these messianic prophecies. Uh, boy, if I could just preach that fast, it would be something else. But I can't. But what we were doing, and one of the unique things about Zechariah is it has eight different visions that are found in Zechariah chapter 1, verse 7, all the way through to chapter 6 and verse 8. And we have looked at four of those visions thus far, and we have tried our very best to stay within the biblical text and look to other sources in the Bible that help us to understand these. And what we have seen is that in the first vision, the vision of horses, remember that that was a vision that expressed God is a God who keeps his promises. That seems to be the message of that particular vision. Then we looked at the second vision, the vision of horns. And in this vision, we concluded that what it is stating is the sovereign power of God. And I think these two visions can go hand in hand. How is it that God, the God that you and I serve, is a God who will always keep his promises to us? Is it not because of his sovereign power? He is an all-powerful God, one who there is nothing that is above and beyond his ability to do. In fact, remember in the book of Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20, unto him who is able to do not just what we ask or think, but exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. And so that's a God that you and I serve, an almighty, powerful, sovereign God. In the third vision, if you remember the vision of the measuring line, this represented, first of all, God's, uh, number one, his uh, power and his presence. It represented the very fact that he was going to protect them and because of the fact that he was going to protect them, his presence would always be with them. Again, look at how these seem to connect. How is it that God could always protect them? And how is it that God is one whose presence would continually be with him? Is it not because of the fact that he is sovereign? A sovereign power has the ability to protect regardless of the circumstance, and the sovereign power has the ability to give us his presence wherever we may be. Remember the fourth vision that we ended by looking at last Wednesday night, was the vision of the high priest. And in this vision, what we determine is that what uh, Zechariah is trying to tell them is that we serve a God who is willing to forgive. What I love about this section is that you don't read about what the people had to do in order to be forgiven. Now, I, I'm not saying that I love that because of the fact that there's nothing that you and I have to do. But what I love is that Zechariah is stressing God's ability to forgive. You're going to see in the, I believe it is the sixth vision, uh, in that particular vision, you're going to see the justice of God because God is going to proclaim that 
if they don't repent, then he is going to punish them. So that removes the idea that there's nothing that you and I do to in order to have forgiveness. But what Zechariah is doing is he is stressing the power of God. God has the ability to forgive regardless of what sin that you and I commit in this life. And we talked about the source through which all of that forgiveness resides. It resides in the branch. And you and I identified in the Messianic prophecies of Zechariah that the branch was none other than Jesus Christ. And so when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he made forgiveness of sins possible for every individual who has always lived. You can see that in the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, I believe it is, where in the Hebrew writer would point out the fact that the blood of Jesus is an element that reaches all the way back to Adam. It reaches all the way today, all the way to the time when Jesus comes and this world is no more. Now, what we want to do is we want to look at the next vision, and it is the vision of the lampstand and the olive trees. It's found in chapter 4, the entire chapter. Now, in looking at these visions, I want you to understand what we ought to try to do. We ought to look at all of these visions by asking ourselves, before we try to figure out what it means, we ought to ask ourselves, what if Zechariah were sitting here among us today? He's sitting right over there, and he is listening to us read this letter, and he is listening to us describe and explain this letter. What we would want to do is present it in the way that Zechariah would say, yes, that is exactly what I'm talking about. We would not want to approach it with some kind of idea that Zechariah would say, no, that's not what I'm talking about at all. Now, in reading this particular vision, there are some things that I do not understand. But any time that you are looking at a section of Scripture, always strive to look at what you can clearly understand and go from there. Build upon that point. Try to find the main point that the writer is trying to get across to the people. Now, I would love it if some good reader uh, would read all 14 verses. I, I think it's important that we read these verses together. And if some good brother would just, with that strong bellowing voice, and I'm not going to name anyone, but if you would read this chapter, uh, I would be in debt to you. I might share some peanut brittle that has been given to me. Only a piece or two, but anyway. Someone read that. The angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that's waking out of sleep. And said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candle said, All of gold with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof, and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked to me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel that talked to me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, 
nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain. And he shall bring forth a headstone thereof with shoutings, saying, Grace, grace unto it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hand shall also finish it, and thou shalt know who is the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and see the plummet in the land of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. Then answered I and said unto him, to, to him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord the whole earth. Okay, now, in looking at this vision, let's notice some key ideas. Number one, the Bible teaches us that Zechariah has fallen asleep. It seems as if he is just completely exhausted from the uh, messages that he has heard. Now, in order to understand that, you have got to go back and try to put yourself in their situation, okay? At this particular time, the temple had not been completely rebuilt. We're going to see that here in just a moment. And so, at this particular time, the temple had not been completely rebuilt, and and so in this particular uh, vision, he has these four visions. Number one saying that it is going to be rebuilt. And number two, you've got the almighty powerful hand of God. You've got the forgiveness and you've also got the presence and the protection of God. It was exhausting to him and he fell asleep. The angel awakes him and shows him another vision. Involved in this vision, note if you will, is a lampstand and two olive trees. Now, the description of the lampstand is going to begin in verse 4 and go through verse 10. Beginning in verse 11, and going through verse 14, he is going to explain the meaning of the two olive trees. Now, let's begin, first of all, with the lampstand. Now, I, I want us to, first of all, get an idea of the time or the era of time right now, when this is being written or when this vision occurs. Remember a moment ago I said that the temple had not been finished. How do I know that? Well, if you will drop down to verse 9, look at what it says. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. Now look at the next line. His hands shall also do what? What does that imply? That it had not been built. So you've got the implication right there in the text. But also the date will let us know that the temple had not yet been completed. Remember the era of time where in Ze uh, Zechariah prophesies. Go back to chapter 1. And in verse 1, in chapter 1, in verse 1, what time frame do we have? It is the second year of King Darius. Now, when did Darius reign? Darius began his rule in 522 B.C., and he reigned 
until 486 B.C., okay? If he began to reign in 522, and this is the second year of his reign, then the date would be 520. Are you with me? So when Zechariah begins to prophesy, when he has these visions, it is 520 B.C. Now, open your Bibles or go to your Bible. Just turn to Ezra chapter 6 and verse 15, and we will get along just fine. Go to Ezra chapter 6 and verse 15, and someone read that. Now, let's think and do some math. The book of Zechariah was prophesied in 520 B.C. Note, if you will, that the temple was finished in what year of the reign of Darius? It was the sixth year. So, six from 22, what year do you have? 516 B.C. Remember, we're going backwards. And so, when Zechariah prophesies, it is 520 B.C. Has the temple been finished? No, because the temple was not finished until 516 B.C., okay? That era of time is going to be important in understanding what is the meaning of this vision right here, okay? Now, the second thing that I want you to note is the man that this prophecy is being given to. He is named, if you'll note, in verse 6 as Zerubbabel. You with me? Note, if you will, this is the word of the Lord to who? to Zerubbabel, and he is mentioned all throughout the remainder of this text. Now, who was Zerubbabel? Zerubbabel was the king at that time. And I have to ask myself the question, what part did he have in the building of the temple? Now, let's go back to the book of Ezra, Chapter 1. Let's go to Ezra chapter 1. In Ezra chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, note that the Bible says, Now in the first year of who? Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom. Now, what was that proclamation? I want you to drop down to verse 3. Who is among you of all his people? May his God be with him and let him Go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and do what? Build the house of the Lord. And so the Lord stirs up Cyrus. Question, when did Cyrus reign? Cyrus reigned from 539 until 530 B.C. And the Bible says in the first year, so this would have been 539, 19 years earlier from the book of Zechariah. Are you with me? We're letting the Bible do the math for us. We're just recognizing, okay? Now, Cyrus determines that God's people are going to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. Now, who is involved? In, that, in those people who are going back. Look at chapter 2, 
of verse uh, 1, uh, chapter 2 of Ezra, verse 1. Now these are the people of the province who came back from the captivity of those who had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away to Babylon, and who returned to Jerusalem and Judah, everyone to his own city. Those who came with who? There he is. There is our man where Joshua, Nehemiah, and so forth. What I want you to see is that Zerubbabel went back to Jerusalem with the mission, with the intent, with the plan of God. Remember that this was not the doing of Cyrus. Don't think that for a minute. Who's, who was it that stirred his spirit? It was God. And so who is behind this plan? God is behind this plan. Remember that God is a sovereign God. Are his plans ever thwarted or destroyed or altered or taken away by man? Any time that God has a plan, because he is a sovereign God, it is going to be carried through. Okay, now, Zerubbabel here, he goes back to help rebuild the temple. Now, what happens as he is going back and he begins the work on the temple? Look at chapter 4. Go to chapter 4 and begin reading in verse 1. Someone, if you would, read verses 1 through 5. When verse 2 starts out, it seems as if a good thing is happening. You've got these people who come in, they say, hey, we want to help you rebuild the temple. But do not forget how this passage begins. How are they described in verse 1? Adversaries. What is an adversary? Or better yet, what is another individual in the Bible who is identified as our adversary? He's Satan, okay? And who do these people serve? If they are adversaries of God's people, then the only answer is that they serve Satan. And so they come in with this idea thinking that they want to help them, but according to the Bible, they were the adversaries, meaning that they had deceptive intentions. And how does uh, Zerubbabel and uh, Joshua or Jeshua respond? No, it's not going to happen. Now, We've got another individual introduced right here, along with Zerubbabel. Who is it? It is Jeshua or Joshua. Who was Jeshua? Well, back up into chapter 3 in verse 2, and look at what it says. 
then Jeshua, the son of jo Josadak, and his brethren, the who? The priest. Jeshua was the high priest at this time. That's going to be important later on. Don't forget that, okay? Jeshua was the high priest. But Zerubbabel, the king, and Jeshua, the high priest, said no. So when they said no, what did the people do in verse 4? They troubled them. That word troubled means to discourage. And not only did they trouble them, but they hired people to trouble them. Now, automatically what you see, you see Zerubbabel and you see Jeshua and they are going back to begin to build on the house of God. And what happens? They are discouraged. Keep that in mind. These men are discouraged. Now, when you are discouraged, what is it that you need in order to press on? Encouragement, okay? When you're discouraged, you need encouragement, okay? Keep that thought in mind, and let's go back to our text. Remember that the temple has not yet been completed. Let me ask you why. Because the people of the land discouraged them. And if we would have continued to read on in the book of Ezra, you would see that those people, their adversaries, did everything within their power to stop the construction of the temple of God. But remember, whose plan was it to have the temple rebuilt? It was God's, not Cyrus, not Darius, and it was not even Zerubbabel. It was God, okay? Now, with that thought in mind, now let's go back to our text and look at this message that God gives to Zerubbabel. Look at what he says in verse 6. Not by might, nor by power, but by what? My spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, what would it be? Or what would it become? A plan. What is God saying to Zerubbabel right here? There makes no difference what may appear before you in the horizon. It does not matter how great the mountain may be. When the Lord is involved, it becomes a what? A plain. In other words, God was going to take away every obstacle in their lives. Look at the remainder of verse 7. And he shall bring forth a capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Who would bring forth the capstone? Zerubbabel would. He would be the one who would bring that last final stone to the temple and set it in place. And what would the people do? The people would begin to shout and rejoice. And then again, beginning in verse 8 and going through verse 10, what God does is he reiterates the fact that this plan is not going to be thwarted by man. Look at what he says in verse 9. The hands of who? Again, Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands shall also finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small things? I like that verse. Who has despised the day of small things? You know, the adversaries of Zerubbabel, 
they may have looked upon the building of this temple. That's just a small thing. But whose plan was it? It was God's plan. And the promise of this temple being rebuilt is also connected to the promise that there would come a future temple. And the future temple is identified in the book of 1 Corinthians as a church. And the church is identified as a people. And so in this passage of scripture, again, you've got God telling Zerubbabel that my plans are going to be continued with. Verse 10, for these seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. They are the eyes of the Lord, which scan to and fro throughout the whole earth. Now, when you and I look at this, what is the message of this lampstand? It is a message of encouragement. When God puts forth a plan, is anyone going to stop it? No. Now, I want you to think about how that you and I can make application into our lives today. Number one, when you and I think about the many promises that God has made, you think about God's plans for you and me. And when I think about God's plans for you and me, you know what I think about? I think about that holy Jerusalem. It is God's plan that his people, those who are faithful to him, will someday be with him in that holy city. Now, as long as I remain faithful to God, who is going to interrupt or disturb that plan? No one. Not one single individual. Because whose plan is it? It is God's plan. And that's something I can hold on to in this life. Because when God makes a plan, I need to be encouraged that he is going to carry through with it. All the way up to the very end. Don't ever get to thinking in life that maybe, maybe perhaps, God is not going to be able to save me. Maybe perhaps that God, because of the circumstances in life, because of the many bad things that happen in life, that maybe perhaps that God doesn't know and that God is not going to be able to carry through with this plan. Never think that. Because the Bible says, note if you will, the eyes of the Lord which skin to and fro throughout the whole earth. A lot of people focus on the seven in that particular uh, passage and they think of God having seven eyes. Number one, when you think about eyes, what comes to your mind? Vision being able to see things. The number seven is a number of perfection in the Bible. So when it's speaking of God's vision, what is it saying? It's perfect. He sees and he knows all things in this world. A lot like what the Hebrew writer would say of him in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13. Behold, all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And so God sees all, he knows all, and nothing, absolutely nothing, is going to disturb his great plans for you and for me. Okay, now, in verses 11 through 14, you have the description of the two olive trees. Now, if you will note in verse 13, 
Well, you can get caught up and hung up in verse 12, wondering what the branches that drip uh, receptacles of the two gold pipes which the oil drain. You can focus in on what does that mean? Or you can look at exactly what the angel said to Zechariah. In verse 13, after he answered, after he asked, what are these two olive trees? Then he answered me and said, do you not know what these are? And he said, no, my Lord. Look at verse 14. These are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. The question is, who are these two anointed ones? That's what's most important. Under the Old Testament, there were two individuals who were anointed. Number one, the high priest was anointed. Go with me, if you will, to the book of Exodus chapter 30 and verse 30. Exodus chapter 30 and verse 30. And someone read that, if you will. Right? Who was anointed with oil? It was the high priest, was it not? Now, go to Leviticus chapter 21 and verse 10. Leviticus 21 and verse 10. Someone read that one. Okay, there's another passage talking about the high priest. And the high priest was anointed. But there's another individual in the Old Testament who was anointed. Let's read about him in 1 Samuel chapter 9, beginning in verse 27. 1 Samuel 9, verse 27. Someone read verse 27 and then read verse 1 of chapter 10. two people were anointed. It was the high priest and the king, okay? In this passage, who do you have? You have Zerubbabel, who is the king, but also, if you remember, if we were to go back to Haggai chapter 1 and verse 1, you're going to see that Jeshua, the high priest, was there. The two anointed ones is clearly Zerubbabel and Jeshua. Why is it that he makes mention of them as being the anointed ones? Them being the anointed ones is not as important as what the Bible says about them. Where are they standing beside the Lord of the whole earth? In other words, standing beside the Lord. Note, if you will, 
they are standing beside the Lord. What does that signify? They have the approval of the Lord. The only ones who can stand by the Lord is if they are doing his will. Now, remember this whole vision. Number one is about the very fact that in this particular passage, what God says to them is he gives them a word of encouragement. What is that word of encouragement? I am going to carry through with my plans, and you have my approval. Now, you're talking about a message of encouragement. Isn't that a message of encouragement for you and me? Number one, is God going to carry through with his plans? Yes. Number two, as long as we walk in the light, as he is in the light, do we have his approval? Yes. So you and I go home tonight with a message on our heart that God is a God who is going to carry through with his plans and I have his approval. You've been a great class as you always are. I know that we only looked at one vision tonight, Lord willing, we will try to look at as many as we can uh, next Wednesday night, uh, but uh, we will pick up right there in the sixth vision, Lord willing, next Wednesday night. Good evening, everyone. Sure is good to have everyone here on this rainy Wednesday. If you're the kind of person that likes rain, I suppose you're just about as happy as you've been in a while. I'm always happy to get the rain, but sometimes, uh, like Dalton said in his prayer, sometimes it's a, a little less convenient than others. So we are thankful that God gives the rain on the just and the unjust. We do have several folks on our prayer list. I'd like to share some of those with you, some updates and reminders. Uh, continue to keep David Payton in your prayers. Keep Ruth Crow in your prayers. She's not able to be out. She's got some bad back and 
uh, problems where she had a fall as well. Joyce Wright, she continues to heal up after she's had her her shot in her back to help her out. Uh, Ralph Mann is doing better now, uh, on, and he's on his physical therapy for three weeks, so we want to continue to pray for him that that physical therapy will help him out. Uh, Tish Clark had her surgery today, and I don't have an update on that yet, but I know that she had her surgery to remove that cancer that they found in her, so say an extra prayer for Sister Tish Clark as well. Danny Thomas is still in the hospital. Uh, I don't have an update on him other than that. Continue to remember him in your prayers. Also, Bill and Jeanette Shelby and Jerry Broom, a uh, friend of Tracy that's not doing very well. Also, um, Kelly's grandmother, Ethel Weaver, keep her in your prayers as well. Renita Brady has terminal cancer in his own hospice care, so if you haven't seen her a card lately, be sure and get her another card out in the mail to help encourage her as well as uh, Becky Hoagland as well needs our prayers. Added to the prayer list tonight is uh, Marva's sister, Alanda Clark. Uh, her cancer has come back and she's starting treatments on that and we certainly just need to remember her in our prayers and, uh, and her family as well. Don't forget about our youth activity this Sunday. Uh, it'll be the candlelight tour at the uh, Marsh House. There is a sign-up sheet for finger foods and uh, devotional that they're going to do before going to, to take that candlelight tour. Uh, also, our youth-led worship for January will be on the 1st. I think it's really great that uh, Christmas falls on a Sunday this year, so we get to uh, be with our family on Christmas and on New Year. Uh, I think Jesus said it best when... People came and said, hey, your family's outside. And he said, y'all are my family. So I agree with what David said in the, when he started class. It is a great encouragement to be able to look out and see everyone here. And we sure do hope to see everyone here uh, the next several weeks. Men's breakfast for January is going to be on January 7th. Down in the fellowship room, there's a sign-up sheet for that on the bulletin board. Uh, the teen singing on January 8th is going to be at uh, Bethel Church of Christ in Dunlap. That's a pretty good little drive, so go ahead and keep that on your calendar and plan on uh, saving up some gas for that trip. Uh, door knocking for January will be on the 14th, so go ahead and mark that on your calendar so you'll be ready for that as well. A couple of updates. Uh, Frank and Francis have a new address, and it is posted on the bulletin board. So if you want to go by and, and aggravate Frank because he really needs aggravating, you know, his address is back there. You know right where he is. There's also a, uh, a new name and address list uh, updated on the shelf in the foyer on the right side if you're going out. That's all the announcements I have at this time. Uh, at the end of the lesson today, after the invitation, our closing prayer will be led by Brian Pettyjohn, and we will turn our songs over to Kate. My first song will be 684, which world is not my home. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the
as others have said, good evening, everybody. <laughs> it's good to see you. I've looked forward to this for several days, ever since I looked on the back of uh, uh, bulletin board back here and saw my name on it for the 14th. And I said, oh boy, here we go. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank every one of you for coming out on a rainy night. Bless your hearts, every one of you. I hope you're, you've had a good day. Tonight we're going to be talking about uh, light, that you are the light. Our scripture is going to be uh, from, uh, let's see, what is it going to be from, Lee? You have it up here? Matthew 5, <laughs> Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, what does it say? Matthew 5, starting at verse 14. It says, ye are the light of the world. Now Christ is talking to his disciples, he's talking to us today too. Ye are the light of the world. What does it mean? Like a city that is set upon the hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lamp stand. And it gives light unto all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That's what we need to be doing, doesn't it? And you know, the Bible tells us what we need to do and it tells us how to do it. That's one thing I'm so very thankful for that God, he doesn't, he doesn't leave us to our own devices. He gives us a full knowledge of what we need to be doing. And it's a wonderful thing. And I've got a little, uh, I've got a little bit of an example here. Take a look at this here, would you? If I can get it going. Let your lights shine before men. If you have lights that, and if your light's doing like this, it's kind of on and off, isn't it? It's symbolizing uh, that sometimes we let our light shine, sometimes we don't. And does God want us to be that way, or do we, does he want us to be consistent? We have some lights that, you know, still on and off, and, and uh, sometimes we don't feel good. Sometimes we may think to ourselves, well, you know, uh, I'm not going to encourage that person, or I'm not going to say those words to that person that I need to. And so, so your light's just on and off. It's not consistent. When we have inconsistencies in our lives, sometimes it's the way it, it looks. You know, it may look inter entertaining for a while, and, and it may catch our attention. But you know what? When we let our light shine, and it lets people know that we're solid and we're shining. And, and, you know, it, it, keeps a, it keeps the light on because people are looking at us. They're looking at us for light. There's more people out there in your family and in the world that are looking for light than they're looking for darkness. They're trying to get away from the darkness. They're looking for answers. They're looking for hope. They're looking for the good things in life. That's your opportunity to let your light shine. Well, how do you do that? You do that by extending what we've learned in God's Word. And how to do that, you know. So as we look at it, you know, we, we, we turn over to Matthew 20, Matthew 25. And let's see what God says in Matthew 25. He starts out talking about uh, the kingdom of heaven. And he describes the kingdom of heaven. In the very first few verses of Matthew 25, he talks about the, the ten virgins. Here's the ten virgins. And they're going out and they got their lamps. And they're going to go forth to meet the bridegroom. That's Christ. It says five of them were wise and five were foolish. The five that were wise, it says, they took took their lamps, in the, or that is, those, those that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. They were not prepared. They did not did not get prepared. But those who were wise, uh, uh, they they uh, were ready for the bridegroom. As we continue on in the, in the reading for, from that Matthew twenty five, that these wise virgins have, were ready. They had their lamps trimmed. These lamps represent the light of their life and the light that they're put forth. They were ready. They were ready. You know, tonight we need to reflect on that. If we're going to let our light shine, you know, you have to have the power of the gospel to light your light. That's part of what the power of the gospel is. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ in Romans chapter 1, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Whenever we, we uh, receive the gospel and we're, we are, uh, Hear the gospel and we repent of our sins. We confess Christ. We're baptized for remission of sins. Come into contact with that blood. That's when that power of the gospel turns our light on. And we have the light to shine forth to the world. That's where we get our power from the gospel. From God, he gives it to us. Another part of chapter 25, and one of the ways that we can do that, that God uh, lets us know, 
He, he says over there, you know, start in verse 31. <clears throat> Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from the other as a shepherd divides his sheep from goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but on the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hunger, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. Naked, you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous say to them, saying, Lord, when do, when do we see you a hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave you drink, or saw thee a stranger, took you in, naked, clothed you? Or when saw we, saw, uh, we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say to them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. You know, whenever we're going to let our light shine, as we're Christians and we're going to let our light shine, here's some of the things that Christ told us to do. You know, to go out to the world, let your light shine. Whenever you see the hungry, hunger, especially of spirit, and those who need to come in to the, obey the gospel, preach to them, talk to them, invite them to come to church. Let your light shine. Whenever you see uh, somebody who's sick, either sin sick or even physically sick, you're going to go help them. You're going to do everything that you can. Christ mentioned all these things in this that, uh, that he said, you know, if you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. You have shown, let your light shine unto all of these. You've let your light shine before me. And I will tell my Father in heaven, you know, that you are approved. So Christ will approve us if we let our light shine before men. I hope that you're letting your light shine. You know, if you've never obeyed the gospel, you don't have a light to shine. You ever thought about that? A person walks around the earth and says, I'm a good person. Oh, I'm great. I do a lot of good things. I do this, that, and the other. And you know what? If a person never obeys the gospel, what is he going to hear at the end? The scripture says, depart from me. I never knew you. What sad, sad words it is. A person that has never obeyed the gospel, you don't have a light to shine. But whenever we obey the gospel, that's we have the power of salvation. The power of the gospel gives us that power to light our light. And we can shine it forth. Not a blinking light, not an off and on light, but a constant light. I hope that you are, have obeyed the gospel. If you have, you got a light. Let your light shine. And those of you who are do, who are letting your light shine, bless your heart. Good for you. Keep on letting it shine, just like David said a while ago uh, in his message. He was talking about never give up. Continue on. Continue on, because we have that promise. If you've never have let your light shine, if you don't have a light shine because you haven't obeyed the gospel, then tonight's your night. You can receive that power from on high through the forgiveness of sins through obeying the gospel, hearing, hearing the word of God, believing that Christ is the Son of God, and confessing his name before men. Yes, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and repenting of your sins and being back to baptized. So that's where we come into the contact with the blood of Christ. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Quote, Jesus Christ. Tonight, if you have uh, obeyed the gospel and there's something that stands between you in God and salvation and you know it and it's a public thing tonight's your night also to come forward and receive the, the uh, prayers of the church if you're subject to the gospel call in any way please come forward as you sing this song
thank each and every one who has come out tonight. You hear that rain on the roof? Those are blessings coming from God. You be careful going home in it when you're driving through these blessings, okay? Thank you so much, all of you, for being here tonight. Please come back Sunday after a 10 o'clock Bible study, 11 o'clock worship. And we pray that each and every one would have a great, great week. Thank you so much. One other announcement I forgot to mention that Ilana and Dusty found out today they're going to have a little baby girl. Her name is going to be Ellie Mae. Isn't that beautiful? It's wonderful. Congratulate these two, would you? And uh, after, we're, we're going to have a closing prayer. Any other announcements need to? Okay, let's have a closing prayer. Let us go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and the many blessings you bestow upon us. Heavenly Father, bless the sick and the afflicted according to thy will. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing those back that are sick for the better now. Heavenly Father, forgive us of our shortcomings, forgive us of our sins, and forgive those who sin against us. Heavenly Father, thank you for the great lessons tonight by Brother David Payton and Brother John Shields. Let us put it to our everyday walks of life. And thank you for Brother Caleb for the fine sign leading he does. Heavenly Father, as we depart, let us let our light so shine before men that we bring many souls to thee. In Jesus' name, amen.